here to tell you about the search for alien life. Not UFOs or little green humanoids, but the search for planets orbiting other stars, planets that may be able to support life and might even have signs of life on them. So every star is a sun, and if our sun has planets, it makes sense that the other stars have planets also, and they do. And we know of thousands of planets. Really, every star is expected to have a planetary system. So the next time you go out to the night sky, I want you to look up at each star and wonder what kind of planets are around that star. When I go out to the night sky, I wonder what is out there? Who is out there? And I think about the brave explorers of the distant future, the near future who might go to Mars, and the way distant future with hopefully the help of genetic engineering may be able to travel to these distant new worlds. And in fact, to make that possible, I and others are working on a brand new kind of map. Not a map of Earth, which is all charted, but a map of the stars and of the locations of new worlds around those stars and some characteristics about those planets to take that first step in what is going to be a generations long journey. So let me tell you the beginnings of this map. If we could go outside tonight and shut off all the city lights and look up, we would see the stars, we would need binoculars to see this image, but actually you can download a software called Eyes on Exoplanets and get the view from anywhere on Earth. So I did this for you. And if you look here, you can see the white dots are known stars. This is a real map of our sky. And the highlighted ones are stars with known planets. And this is just a small part of the sky, and I wanted you to get a sense of how up there now, this is how many uh, planets we know about, thousands of planets around nearby stars. And the different colors correspond to different star types. Well, in our journey of making the map of the sky, uh, our latest mission is a NASA mission called TESS, Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And by the way, next year in 2019, a Swiss-led mission, CHAOPS, will also go up to look for planets and characterize them. Now TESS, you can see the size, it's not very big, and you can see from the people how big it is. Inside, you see these four tubes. They're essentially four specialized telephoto lenses. And they're not very big, they're about 10 centimeters in diameter but they have these giant baffles to block out light from the sun and moon, from rather the Earth's reflected light and moon. And you can see there's solar panels and there's an antenna to communicate with Earth. Here's an image of the sky taken by Tess. I hope you can enjoy the beauty of it. And this actually is just one small part of, this is about 1 16th of the field of view that Tess looks at, each field of view for one month. And now my job on TESS as Deputy Science Director, believe it or not, it's actually a real job to find planets. <laughs> and this week my team is looking at the third month of TESS data, and they actually are, they found, I don't know, dozens and dozens of planet candidates this month. So the way that TESS and others find planets is by looking for a transit. If a planet, um, you can see on the top, there's a fake star, and do you see the fake planet? And on the bottom is what we observe. We can observe the star's brightness as a function of time. And looking if by chance there's a planet that happens to be perfectly aligned. And so that the planet goes in front of the star as seen by the telescope. And that starlight drops by a tiny, tiny amount. So tests, for example, can look at thousands or hundreds of thousands of stars at once. And our computers tabulate um, the brightness of each star on all the images as a function of time and will flag stars that show this drop in brightness. And if one such one does, the computer will spit out a one-page summary and a 50-page report on each object. And humans and computers will go through these extra diagnostics to try to figure out whether it's a planet candidate or a false positive or a false alarm. And just to give you the flavor of what happens, how hard it is, well, easy but hard at the same time, the planet's candidates then get farmed out to hundreds of people all around the world, including the experts here in Switzerland, who follow up to see if it's a planet or not. So we do one more thing, though, that's kind of cheating, actually, in exoplanets. We're trying to make our job as easy as possible, because to find another Earth is so hard. The planet is like... The star is big and bright and massive, and the planet is like right next to the big, bright, massive star. So in exoplanets, this kind of cheat is we're going to look at, we focus on the very smallest stars out there. And here I'm showing you a real image of our sun, and you can see the fake planet. 
And now I'm showing you a fake image of the smallest type of star out there. And you can see the fake planet takes out much more of the area of the star on the small one compared to the big one. And it's much easier to find planets around these small stars. A drop in brightness for an Earth and Sun would be one part in 10,000. For this planet, same planet size planet around a small star, it's one part in 100, which is way easier to measure than one part in 1,000. And there's many other reasons as well that makes it easier. So just for fun, let me take you on a virtual trip to one of these planets orbiting an M dwarf, a small red dwarf star. So it turns out that the small stars have very low energy output. And so the planet has to be very close to the star for it to be a good temperature for life to exist. What this means is that the star or the sun may be very big in the sky, as shown here by the artists. And this artist has taken the artist's license to make the sky red. We don't really know what the, the sky would be like. Now, what's amazing about these planets is because they're very close to the star, tidal interactions, just like on Earth, you know, we have tides, the ocean rises and falls, and the Earth raises tides on the moon as well. Because of tidal interaction over millions of years, the planet goes into its lowest energy state where it's so-called tidally locked. It rotates only one time for every time it orbits. Just like our moon shows the same face to Earth at all time, the planet has a permanent day and night side. So if we could go to this planet, would you go to where it's always daytime? Or where it's always night? Perhaps for your getaway, you'd like to go where the sun is always setting. <laughs> that would be permanent. <laughs> And because the planet is close to the star by Kepler's third law, it goes around the star very quickly. A year would only be about 10 days, so your birthday would be every 10 days. We have to totally reorganize the way we think. Now, going to this planet around an M dwarf star actually might be a terrible idea. Because these red dwarf stars, they give off flares, giant bursts of high energy particles that would destroy our skin. What type of sunscreen would we bring? We'd probably get like genetic mutations unless we can engineer ourselves to be safe against that type of radiation. We couldn't flip out our phones all the time because the high energy particles would destroy the electronics. And now Kepler, a space telescope called Kepler observed a field of stars that had uh, one particular famous red dwarf star called TRAPPIST-1. And over an 80 day period, the star showed 40 flares. And one of those flares, extrapolating to how much total energy it had, was called to be equivalent to a giant event we had on Earth in 1850 called the Carrington event. What happened in 1850 was all pieced together because people didn't really understand magnetic fields and the famous Maxwell's equations were not yet articulated. But what happened was our sun emitted a giant flare and a small piece of our sun with a magnetic field came hurtling towards Earth. It hit Earth's magnetic field and induced a current and our Earth became electrified. People could see northern and southern lights all the way to the equator. Here in Switzerland, you'd be able to read by them at night. Telegraph operators took the batteries out and the telegraph still worked. And some of them got their fingers burned because our whole earth was charged up. Now, if that happened today, it would be a problem for us, for our power grid <laughs> and all the electricity we use. But imagine we, uh, these planets out there that could have s these flares, giant flares, you know, every 80 days or so that are so destructive. We're not sure about these planets around these small stars, whether they're good for life or bad for life. We're so fragile, we probably couldn't survive there unless we hid in caves or on the dark side. But I wanted to give you a flavor of one type of planet out there. Um, and it turns out that each planet, if I had time to describe like that, I could tell you stories about like a dozen different types of planets. They're all very different and all in some ways very special. Like, all your children are special, and all of our planets are, are very special. Well, it turns out that transiting planets, the ones that go in front of their star just by chance, are part of a long story because they're the easiest things for us to do now. I'm not sure if you and your job do the easy thing first, or do you also invest in the very hard things? Because it turns out that finding our solar system, a planet just like Earth around a star just like our sun, is very, very hard. And I think that it's so compelling for us to want to find a planet like Earth. I see the red dwarf stars I described with the planets like a cousin rather than a twin. And imagine for a moment that you've gone on 23andMe, get your genes tested and you, you're gonna see your ancestry. And you go on there and you find that you have a cousin. Maybe it's um, a very distant cousin of a different generation and lives in a different country and speaks a different language. This actually happened to me, by the way. 
I went home 23 and me, and it said I had a first female cousin, but it wasn't one of my female cousins. And I wrote to the person, hi, this is Sarah, could you please, hi, who are you? No response at all. But later I found out from other people who joined that it ended up being a distant cousin who was like decades older. You know, she's on her fourth husband and she lives in another, not another country, but in the US, California, kind of may as well be another country. And yeah, anyway, imagine you go on 23andMe and it's not just the distant cousin you find, but you find that, wow, you have an identical twin somewhere. That's like such a different feeling. And for me, the thought of that finding that other earth where someday we may be able to go to is really the thing we want to invest in. And it's very hard. We have to imagine that our own earth is not, it's uh, you know, 10,000 times for that little transit light curve. But transits are very rare. We must have a new way to block out starlight so that we can see planets directly. And the idea I'm gonna tell you about, it actually was first invented in the 1960s and revisited every decade since. I just happened to be here at the right time to get to lead this effort. It's called Starshade. So the Starshade and Telescope can launch together. And these very petals will unfurl from their stowed position with this central truss opening to snap into place. This special screen would be tens of meters in diameter. And it would have to formation fly tens of thousands of kilometers from its telescope so that it could block out the starlight around a very nearby sun-like star to see what's around it. And this star shade, by the way, I don't, it's complicated to explain, but it's because light can act like a wave and bend around the edges of objects that it has to be such a special shape and that it has to be so far from the telescope. Here's myself and some team members at NASA JPL out in California, and you can see one petal to scale. It's so big and so pointy, and this very special shape, it has to be incredibly precisely made and precisely formation flown with its own telescope. Here's a picture of the Starshade Lab, where you can see uh, scale models of the Starshade, so the engineers can figure out how to stow and deploy this, um, what will be magnific magnificent piece of technology. So what will we do when we find these other planets? We want to look at the atmospheres. We need to know the greenhouse power of the gases in the atmosphere, so we could tell if one of the planets around either the M dwarf star or a sun-like star could have the right surface temperature for life. We'd like to find water vapor, because water vapor on a small planet indicates liquid water oceans. And all life on Earth needs water, so it's a good place to start. Next, we'll look for gases that don't belong, that are there in such huge quantities we might be able to ascribe them to life. Did you know on our own Earth, we have oxygen filling our atmosphere to 20% by volume. But without plants and photosynthetic bacteria, our Earth would have no oxygen. So it could be there's intelligent life with the kind of telescopes we're trying to build elsewhere, looking back at our Earth. And if they see oxygen, they'll be thinking, wow, that is just such a reactive gas. It really shouldn't be in our atmosphere at all. And they may sort of be able to work through all the arguments and leave it with maybe there's life on our planet. And in fact, there's just so many molecules. I just put this little collage up for you. There's other gases made by life, like methane and nitrous oxide and hydrogen sulfide, and it turns out life can make, actually on Earth, makes thousands of gases. And my team actually has a complicated kind of data fusion, data curation project, where we take all the molecules that um, can be in gas form and we filter them to imagine uh, which kinds of planets could survive in an exotic exoplanet atmosphere, and which ones should be on our menu of options, so that in the future, we can look for, science. we'll know we'll either know what we're looking for, or when we see something we don't understand, we'll have a menu of options. Now, for those of you that aren't convinced, um, I know you're a self-selected audience, but if you're not convinced exoplanets are useful, sometimes we're really lucky in exploration of science and ideas. And in my team, when we've been working through so-called chemical space to understand molecules for the search for life, we think we've hit upon something maybe even more interesting about very specific patterns of molecules that life completely avoids. And we're hopeful that pursuing this new line of research, we may be able to work on the origins of life and toxicity and maybe even drug discovery. Another thing my team did was we actually have built a very small satellite called a CubeSat. And this was implemented and operated out of JPL. Here's a picture in the lab from over a year ago. But this little telescope, it's, the telescope is hidden inside the box, and those stretched out parts are solar panels. It's been orbiting Earth for over a year now. And what we wanted to do was find planets, 
but um, it actually developed this brand new technology on how to precision point a small telescope, a small package. It does like 100 times better than anything in its mass category, and its real legacy won't be for planets, but will be for things like optical communication and other space applications. It turns out, though, I won't try to fool you that exoplanets is practical in any way, but the whole world is somehow awakening to the realization that planets are everywhere, and that someday, hopefully not too long from now, we will find signs of life, and we'll have to reevaluate um, where we fit in the cosmos. Sometimes some of our society and religions you know, may be challenged to rethink their basic foundations. So I'd like to leave you with this thought that our night sky has so many stars, and that our night sky and you know, galaxy is just teeming with exoplanets. They're just everywhere. And that someday, in the next, let's say, five, to, five years to decades, we're going to have the capability to know whether a planet could support life, and maybe even whether it has signs of life. And in this way that we're charting the, the stars, making the map of the nearby worlds, and trying to understand something about them, we're starting ourselves on this, what could be this very long journey to eventually get to the other planets around other stars. And in this way, we are writing the future history of humanity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.